When was the first time you ever went to Cooperstown, Bob? First time I ever went to Cooperstown was 1974. I was a student at Syracuse, and Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle got in the same year. Hmm. And so a classmate of mine and I drove, the two of us drove about an hour and a half from Syracuse to Cooperstown. And there was a restaurant owner in Syracuse who somehow was a good friend of Mickey's. And so he snuck me into the library where no members of the media were supposed to be, and who would have recognized me as a member of the media anyway, because <laughs> I was working on the college station at Syracuse. And he introduced me to both Mantle and Ford and kind of vouched for me. And I interviewed Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford on the day that they were inducted into the Hall of Fame. So that was my first trip, 1974. What if you told that Newhouse School student that one day uh, you'd be in the same museum enshrined with those guys, Bob? I, I would have thought that you had lost your mind. Uh, my objective was to become a sportscaster, just like yours was, I'm sure, at the same age, to become a sportscaster, to become good at it, to become good enough to make a living at it, and I hope to be involved in baseball. But at that time, by the way, the broadcaster's wing of the Baseball Hall of Fame didn't even exist. It started a few years after that, and they put Red Barber and Mel Allen in as the very uh, first, the two of them together, I think, in 1978. So the award didn't even exist. But even after it came into existence, uh, I never thought about about this. And in fact, this year was the first time I was eligible. What you said at the start is a very nice thing, and some people have said it to me uh, over this past several months, these past several months. Uh, I thought you were already in, or why did it take so long? This was actually the first year that I was eligible because they changed the rules around. But what, eligible? I mean, yeah. what, like, what, what, so what are the rules? Well, <laughs> they were, up until last year, they were that you had to have been the voice of a team for 10 consecutive years or the voice of network baseball for 10 consecutive years. And I was on NBC from the early 80s till 1989, so that fell just short. Then again from the mid-90s to 2000, then NBC lost baseball again. And then eventually they modernized it, and they changed it to where there are now three categories. So it'll be on a three-year cycle. One category is national voices. So people like me, Joe Buck, Al Michaels, and others were on the ballot this year. Then next year, local voices, which makes sense because what Tom Hamilton does with the Cleveland Indians or what John Miller, who's already in, now does uh, for the Giants, that's a different thing mm -hmm. than what Matt Vaskersian is doing now on ESPN or whatever the case may be. And then the third category is pioneers, people that they may have overlooked, almost all of whom are gone now, uh, guys who did their primary broadcasting in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I thought they they just lowered the requirement. You have to have it, at least 28 Emmys they, they, <laughs> <laughs> in order to be eligible. I mean, and then well, I qualified. Goodness gracious. And so I, it's been a while since I have been to that uh, incredible uh, museum there in Cooperstown, Bob. Uh, so is there a wall for this? Because there's no plaque, right, with an NBC logo on your cap there, correct? <laughs> well, no, actually... Yes, there is an area mm -hmm. that's called Mike Men and Scribes, <laughs> and it, it's really cool. It, it, it has, like, old-style cathedral radios and old-style microphones, and you can push a button and hear Graham McNamee call the World Series or Vin Scully call Koufax's Perfect Game or a Jack Buck call or a Lindsey Nelson call. And then there are plaques that are smaller than the ones that are in the shrine where the players uh, are recognized. But there are plaques that go chronologically according to what year you were inducted. But whoever is the present person, that person stays up there for a year. So Bill King, who was inducted posthumously, terrific all-round broadcaster, the Warriors in basketball, the Raiders in football, uh, and also did the Oakland A's in baseball, he was inducted posthumously a year ago. So his picture, somewhat larger than everybody else, with a scroll beneath it listing his achievements and whatever qualities uh, might have led people to, to vote him in, that stays up for a year. And so that's where I am as of Saturday. And then 
a year from Saturday, I go back into the <laughs> into the list, and, and 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 I become I become a tiny plaque, maybe maybe twice the size of a baseball. Card. A mere Mike man. That's all. Yeah, a mere Mike man. Back. But you know what else is also cool? Right next to that mm-hmm. is baseball at the movies. So it's an old style sort of movie marquee, like you're going to the Bijou Picture Show, and it'll say now showing the natural. And there'll be the movie poster of Robert Redford with, oh, with Glenn Close. Or now showing Bull Durham. And you'll see Kevin Costner with Susan Sarandon. Now showing Eight Men Out. Now showing Billy Crystal's 61. And they have the whole roll call. And there have been more than 150 movies made. Not all of them great, but many of them terrific. More than 150 movies made that had baseball as the central theme. And they're all recognized in some way or another. Uh, And it's just very cool. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern, on Audience.